Th thanks a lot uh, to both of you. Um, I think was, this was really fascinating. Um, and now the idea is to um, have a discussion. And, and let me um, start with you, Charles. Um, one obvious question is, even if... We don't get chairs? Well, if you want, you can no, have a chair. Can, you know. We need a beer, you know. Why don't oh, we, yeah. No. <laughs> That's the way we can do it, you know. Okay, yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you listening? Oh. Yeah. Um, I mean, you had this um, sort of uh, Maslow type of um, staircase, and um, on the top was arts, 18 to 1, I think. 14. 14. Okay. That's a guess. Yeah. Could okay. be 18. I okay. But for, for a society of the, the kind that we, we are living in, whether we talk about the U.S. or Sweden, maybe U.S. is a bit more wasteful. So, but let, let's say an average OECD country. What kind of eroi could still run the economy, roughly? And I mean, maybe we have to close down the operas. Uh, I don't want that. But well, I mean, what would be the minimum required for this type of economy not to collapse or move into a deep recession. You want children? I have children and grandchildren. You want children in this society? Yes. You want to educate them? Well, I try to. No. Do you want, to, in this society, do you want to educate the children? I, I do, yes. Okay. That, so that's, what did I say, uh, you know, nine to one or something? Do you want to... Uh, do you want them to go to graduate school in Uppsala or Stockholm? Lund. Lund. <laughs> oh, no, there's too on. many mosquitoes at Lund. <laughs> not, not yet. Not yet. My um, well, you, you know, you look at the pyramid. So you need, uh, I don't know, 12 to 1, something like that, 10 to 1. Do you want them to have health care? Yes. Do you want to keep old people like me alive? No. <laughs> no. Okay, that's easy then, you know. About 10 to 1. 10 to 1. But we can't keep the and, old people alive. And, and how, how do you explain that most economists seem not to bother about this? You're allowed to say something. Yeah? Huh? He told me I couldn't say bad things about economists. Ooh, I mean, I, I can't say it politely. But it's, it's about toilet training. Um, if, if you're academically toilet trained as an economist, then it's hopeless. Um, I have a, a good paper. I, I, where are you? It's on this website, I think. That, and it's called The Need to Reintegrate the Natural Sciences with Economics. And I, I'm trained as a natural scientist. I'm trained in physics and chemistry and hydrology and ecology and all this stuff, and... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm also a natural scientist, you know. Yeah, so, so we he's quite a physicist, actually. Yeah. And, um, and so if I, if I had a freshman that submitted neoclassical economics to me as a freshman paper, well, I'd actually probably give him an A for originality, but I, I, would, I would cream him, because I would say, well, look, what you do is it... it uh, it violates the second law of thermodynamics. It can't, so this, you know, firms and households model that they use, this, and many other things, violates the laws of thermodynamics. So it can exist, but not on this planet, or solar system, or universe. It can exist here, and, and that's how they're running Sweden. Um, and so, for me, uh, and there are other problems, the boundaries are wrong, and... and you don't see their ideas. You open up an economics textbook, and it's like going to church. Okay, here's the gospel. It's not put for in science. We put forth hypotheses. Most of the hypotheses we put forward are, are wrong, are tested and found to be wanting. Do you find that in an economics textbook? Do you find young people taught to think that way about economics? They say economics is a social science, but it's not a science because it doesn't use the scientific method. It's a series of, of interesting logical constructs that you then go on from there, just like perhaps the church. 
just to add but, one. But, yes. but it, 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 to be the devil's advocate, it has worked pretty well for well, the last... Of course, year. because we, yeah. whatever crazy I, I, idea I, you I, have, you have more oil next year so to make it work. I, I explain why it worked. The fact was that during the 60s, yeah. we were consuming 10 billion barrels of oil per year, and the, the discovery rate was 56. So they had hide away all that oil for us for all these years, so the economists didn't need to think about the energy input. So the models for national economists is all input of energy, don't worry about it. It will always be there. So it was sort of a constant? Yes. Okay. Well, if you, if, if you look at uh, what are called Cobb-Douglas production functions in economics, anybody know about them? And, and, and you know, you have capital and labor. But if you, if you ask a physicist, how do you produce something? You'd probably say, what would you say? Well, I, I need a machine that needs energy. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we can just look uh, in Sweden. Uh, if you go up to uh, Upland, you see where you have the, the mines and the, the um, because it's broke, they the, the produce the irons, you know. What they needed was energy. They need a stream of water. You need some stuff and you need energy. That's why we're trying to develop something called biophysical economics. That's what m uh, my book is about. Mm. A whole not, why should... If economics is about stuff, think about what economics means in your household. It means food on the table, a roof over your head, maybe a Volvo in the, in the driveway, and um, it's stuff. When, so when, why should economics be a social science, or only a social science? When you, when you talk to people in the oil companies about this, and they, they of course, have a lot of, of economists well, hired. He, he what? talks to more people. Nobody talks to me except you guys. <laughs> no, but I mean both of you then. Yes. If, if you if you present this picture, I mean this yes. these scenarios, so to say, to 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 the oil business. I mean they must know what they what they oh, are yeah. doing. Yeah, it's 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 very interesting because if you go to a conference where you have engineers and people that is really working on the fields, no problems for them to understand this. This is reality, they say. But if you go to the management that has an economic training, is a problem. And how, how come that the stock markets, I mean, they, they are not stupid. Yes. Maybe they are. Yes. We have, we, I do have a lot of financial people. We, we run this uh, group uh, that's called Biophysical Economics. We just had a meeting, and it's spread out from my university, the University of Vermont. It's actually growing exponentially, which is scary. And so uh, the people, we have many very, very smart people from Wall Street that come in and listen to us, and we listen to them. Mm -hmm. And that's very good. And incidentally, any of you, I'd like to make a plug. If you want to be on my energy listserv and get be made aware of these, just take your card and put your or a piece of paper and put your uh, ELS on the back, and we'll put you on my yeah. listserv. I, I, I like. But, 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 but what do these guys from 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 Wall Street say then? What what do they say when you say this? Tell them this. They know. So they, but they don't tell us. Of course not. Then you wouldn't invest in them. <laughs> uh huh. So, you, so you, it's it's you, lack of transparency. You find Steve. I've got Stephen Kopitz's uh, talk that he gave at our meeting. I've got it with me on my computer. I'll give it to you. And you, uh, I'm very optimistic compared to Stephen. Um, so. Uh, and, and he is what, Stephen? Well, he's a very very smart financial guy on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, many of these guys know exactly. But, uh, I mean, the same thing is with the industry. I mean, we have in Sweden, for instance, uh, we have uh, Leif Johansson that was the CEO of uh, Volvo Trucks, you know. And he has, for many years, peak oil is real. And peak oil is one of three driving li uh, lines for Volvo Trucks' future production. I have another, another uh, big uh, industries in the world that uh, contact me and say, yes, we take people seriously. But uh, we hope to be first to do it, because then we'll gain market, share. market shares. Before letting the floor open, my one, one last question. Uh, may I, mean, I ask Ed, one more thing, yeah. one and a half more things? Is uh, okay. If you plot uh, Dow Jones average, you, you have to correct it for inflation, because it's just prices. You, you have inflation corrected Dow Jones, and you plot it versus energy use in the U.S. economy. They're the same line, same slope. A lot more wiggles in the 
uh, and I have that with me. I, I have all these things. Uh, and that um, uh, John Holdren, who's our energy advisor, is an old fishing buddy of mine. Mm. I like to fish a lot. And, uh, and he's in my office uh, one week before he takes his position. We're talking about peak oil. And, and we're talking he's about a scientific it. advisor to, to Mr. Yeah. Obama. Yes. Yeah, yeah, very smart guy. And, and, and we're talking about peak oil, you know, just like you and I talk about it. And we're talking about he's uh, very interested to learn about energy return on investment. And I've written him three letters. Why don't you talk about peak oil? And I think after he retires, he's going to say, well, Charlie, I can't talk about that. It would destroy the economy. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, a final question for me, and that is, now, we have, we have some, some volumes left of not cheap, but relatively cheap oil. Yes. How, how, how should we use it the best way for societies to be able to prosper in the future? Well, I think we at must... At least not collapse. We must go back to look at what is our basic thing we need. We need food. We need shelter. And we need a way to make money to buy the food and pay for the shelter. And look after our children. And look after our children as well. So we, we should, for instance, make sure that our shelter don't uh, take extra energy that they don't need to take. You know? And we should uh, be careful. So, so efficiency. Efficiency, yeah. And, and we should try to see how should we change our food production so we, we don't use so much fossil fuel. Because it must continue even if we don't have the fossil fuel. Shell, Shell's diagram of the increase in the energy use, you know... If I was born in 1943, I'm way down here. And here we are now, you know. I had the most wonderful childhood. Yeah. Uh, Our time was great. <laughs> yeah. And I think if we do it intelligently, I, I look to the Swedes for leadership because it's hopeless in my country. Well... <laughs> Don't be too optimistic. Uh, but, I mean, we, we, we have a Swede now that is in charge of uh, Club of Rome, Anders Wickman, you probably knew that. I think we should give him an that, applause that, for that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, no, but, I mean, you showed the image of a solar uh, energy installation. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the problems that I see is that Still today, if we let's say that one thousand billion dollars are being invested in new energy production, roughly in the world. No, no, don't tell me dollars. Tell me energy, because no, dollars no. are only a lean on energy. No, That's no, all no, they are. You okay, know? okay, but let's say that the figure thousand is invested into energy okay. production. Yeah. And out of that, maximum, as I understand it, twenty-five percent is going into the alternatives. Still, around three-thirds are going into oil and gas and coal and whatever. Um, so, if, if I understand it, if we could change that ratio and instead invest more and develop an alternative energy infrastructure, how about that? Well, I, I, I shamelessly self-promotion, I have a not, my next book is with... Pedro Prieto, who's a chief solar engineer in Spain. And it's uh, coming out from Springer. I, I have flyers with me here. Anybody interested in this? We got three. I'm, I'm killing myself. I'm dealing with three, three sets of proofs this week while I'm here in Sweden. Some of you know what that means. It's, so, um, but anyway, uh, we, they, the solar people say they get a, an energy payback in two or three years. But that's only for the modules. So we look at what it takes to actually put these bloody things into operation in Spain. And Spain's sunny, you know, and has very good engineers. And a great place for solar. And you do all of this. And our estimate of uh, ROI is only about 2.6 to 1. I guess I, that's the first time I said that in public. But shh. Um, so, and, and the other people say, well, you know, it's 15 to 1 or 30 to 1 or something. Now, it's based on some assumptions, and you can say they last longer than 25 years and so forth. But I have a, I've, I've come up with a new way to think about it because this was so depressing. Because both you and I agree we should it would be good to move to a yes, solar yes. society if we could see it. Sweet I mean, used to be a solar society from the forests. And so I say, um, let's think about it differently. So if you have um, three unit, heat units of coal... No, you don't have any coal. Do you have coal in Sweden? Not really. No. No, we import some. Well, you, 
Okay, so you imported we coal. Go, so we, you have three we, units of coal, yes. and you put it in a power plant, and you want electricity because electricity is very valuable, um, and you put it into a power plant, and you can get out one unit of electricity, right? Yes, sir. Now, you can take three units of coal and put it into a solar collector in Spain, not in Sweden, in Spain, and get back, you know, six or nine um, from the three, because it's at three to one. Very low EROI, but it's a different... So I look at solar collectors not as an energy source, but as a converter of fossil fuels into electricity. And if you look at it that way, it's much better than simply burning it in the coal plant, except for one thing, it's, it's the discount rate. You, you get it over a long period of time. You have to make the investment up front. I'm Thank you very much. The floor is open. Eva, you had... You. Time is running out, but if you were to give, if you were to give one uh, recommendation to President Obama, what would that be? Read my book. <laughs> Second recommendation is maintain the integrity of the data and be honest. Third thing is stop, encourage us to stop teaching fairy tales in economics classes. We teach a million young people fairy tales in our economics classes. Um, and, and start with the high schools and... You know, he emphasizes science and technology. He's a very intelligent person. I think he knows all this, but you, can he say these things politically? I don't know. So, please introduce yourself. Julien Morel, I'm a civil engineer specialized in energy and environments. I had a question. Uh, I think that both of you talked about the, the volumes of energy, that is the first law, law of uh, thermodynamics, uh, okay. How do you see the second law of thermodynamics in your research? Uh, that is exergy or the, the quality we of agree energy. On it dominates. I mean, of course, that's a very important part also. And we are into then the, say, the second infrastructure of, of our speech, and probably we should discuss it more in detail. But it's clear that that. Uh, exergy, energy that is useful for the society is important when we produce things, you know. Uh, but we can also use what is left, left over as heat for heating things. I mean, in Sweden, we are very good in this because we, we, we are using, uh, uh, for instance, uh, cent district central heating, you know, uh, and then we take uh, a much bigger fraction of the energy available compared to, for instance, uh, just using it for electricity production. But uh, all of these things uh, must also be uh, incorporated in uh, the future, and we are doing research on those kind of things, especially when it comes to windmills. We have done a, a research paper about that. I had a, a, a wonderful talk at our biophysical economics meeting uh, last <coughs> week, and, and the speaker was a historian, and he said the discovery of the second law of thermodynamics absolutely transformed chemistry first, and then physics, and then all of the, you know, geology, all, all of the sciences ecology, except one, economics, which they use these, these um, equations that are based on Hamiltonians, and, and, and it's absurd because it's an insult to Hamiltonians because it's, uh, they make their equations go back and forth, and Hamiltonians can, are unidirectional because of the second law, and it doesn't exist in economic equations. Oh, we, we used to say that economists uh, nowadays still use uh, a pen and a roller when they do their uh, science. I mean, they have not uh, discovered computers yet. No. Well, yeah. They think because it's analytically rigorous that it's conceptually rigorous, and it's not. Next question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Carl Siderström, uh, representing myself. i uh, just like to know, or could you comment, the price of gas has come down or hasn't followed the curve of oil, uh, as I understood it, due to shale gas. Isn't that going to happen to oil in the future? Uh, no. Is this the two different... Uh, it's I mean, because the U.S. economy is, is in recession for five years. Supply and demand, I believe in. Yeah. So the U.S. economy is in recession... And, and yes, the shale, shale oil has made some difference. 
I don't want to say it's not important. It is, it is very important, but it isn't going to save our tail. And, and, and again, when it comes to oil, you know, we, we have the, uh, the, there is the one spot in the U.S. that has a problem, and it's Cushem, you know, that uh, the, 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 you cannot get enough uh, oil passing that part. So it's just one spot that uh, tie up uh, a lot of reserves, and you cannot pay so much. It's cheap, you know. That's why Canada don't like it, because uh, in the U.S., the price of oil is $10, $20 lower compared to the Brent now because of this, uh, uh, this uh, tie-up in Kashem, you know. So, so they like to have another pipeline going out yeah. so they can increase the price. I don't want to say the, sh the, the shale oil is not important. It's important. But it's not nearly as important as Texas or Louisiana. We have a question from, coming from the web, because this is webcast. But may I put the question in, in between? Um, as we all know, the depths of many governments all around the world, not only in Europe, <laughs> but in particular in southern Europe, uh, uh, constitute a, a major problem. And it's being discussed by economists as if it was only a question of money. Um, and when you, factor, when you factor in the fact no, that... No, okay, here's the answer. <laughs> I, I want to represent the largest debtor country in the world, my country. And um, we borrowed a lot of money from Japanese, from, so the Toyota workers retired, I, I'm paying their pension. Um, and so uh, if we paid off all the money we owe just Japan, and we owe much more to China, if we pay off all the money we owe just to Japan, and remember, um, energy is a, I mean, money is a lean on energy, debt is a lean on energy, future energy. And so if we paid all of that off and the Japanese uh, took that money and they bought from the U.S. fish and rice and Fords and whatever they want to buy, um, that to make that amount of stuff would deplete all of our known oil reserves. Meaning that you can't pay it back. I don't. Well, we can burn coal. We got lots of coal. Not that much. Not that. Much. No, come on. We got uh, lots of coal. You yeah. should read our paper. But but, but my question, <laughs> my, my question was really, Charles. My question was really, if prices, when it comes to not only energy but quite a number of other commodities, are on the increase, doesn't this mean that it will be even more difficult to pay back these debts? Not, not, not for the United States, they can borrow money, but for Italy, they cannot borrow money the same, because they have to pay for it, you know, and for uh, other countries. I mean, you must have production, you must have a production that can uh, give money so you can buy the oil. Normally, I cannot buy more uh, than uh, my salary allows me to, to buy if I don't get a loan from the bank, you know. But I have to think about that all the time. So if, if you look at what happens with the oil price... From, uh, from uh, the last 10 years, it went from $25 per barrel up to over 100 you know. It's a factor of four. And Italy didn't increase the export volume with that much, so they cannot pay for that. So, so, so if, if we take and add up all the extra expenses they have had for oil during this time, that is the depth they have now. Here is the question from the web. <clears throat> Referring to the eroid needed for arts and education, didn't already the Greeks have it? without oil. Ah. So is it not more about what kind of art and education? Yes, of course. And we're in this marvelous museum uh, of, of Mediterranean culture, and we've been down and looking at all this wonderful uh, art and so forth. Yeah, well, yes. Um, but I would guess that uh, if you read Painter, you read some of these people that what they did was they went and they, the Romans, let's take the Romans, the Romans went and captured the, all the grain from, uh, from the Nile. You think uh, Anthony was down chasing Cleopatra. No, they were down there getting the grain. And uh, that came and fed the Rome. So by the standards of the time, they certainly had art. And, and also, incidentally, I want to make sure this is clear. Uh, if, it, you, if the pie is not growing, a very important question is how do you divide the pie? But there's one more thing. And the fact is that the Roman and the Greek had slaves. Yes. Slaves yes. was yes. their oil at that yes. time. Yes. The United States had slaves before no. they had oil. So the oil made it possible to abandon slavery. That's right. and there's a new book on it by a guy named Neforic, and, uh, on, and it's called, uh, I don't know, Energy Slaves. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so Eroy was at play also yes. then. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Here is the next question. 
<laughs> My name is Barbara Vales, and I'm from the Worldwide Fund for Nature, WWF. And I have um, actually two questions or reflections. And one is um, actually, if the scenarios you've presented are true, what does that mean actually for, um, yeah, inducing the price of renewables so that it becomes more competitive in the near future? And the other is actually related to Nicole Foss and the kind of scenario that she presents where the peak oil kind of spins an economic crisis similar to what happened in the late 20s, 1920s, and particularly for Sweden where we're in a kind of real estate bubble and what the implications would be for Swedish society. I'd be curious Ask to hear your Greeks. thoughts on that. Ask the Greeks. Ask the Spaniards, especially the Spaniards. They, they know about real estate bubbles, yes. And we can ask the people in UK that don't need to care, think about the fact that they don't have not the euro, so they can just print more money. You know. uh, yeah, the, the, the fact is that, that uh, we have uh, an environment to take care of. But the thing is that the society, as it was pointing out, cannot take a too high price of oil. We saw when the oil price of oil reached... 147 barrels per, uh, dollars per barrel, the economy <coughs> crashed. And uh, at that time, before it happened, I listened to a seminar by the CEO of uh, Airbus. And he got the question, how high can the price of oil be? And he said, well, I can tell you one thing. If the price ever will reach $200 per barrel, there will not exist an airline industry, period. And, and, and then that is the end of globalization. And that is the end of the, the growth of the economy. It, it, and so that means the price will not be enough for the green energy to come in at the price that is not produced. Oh, maybe. maybe. But, but the thing is, you see, uh, the, the economist argues that just let the price of oil go up, we'll always get some more. And, but the trouble is, as the price goes up, the energy return on investment is going down. The yeah. e dollar amount goes up, the energy investment is going up too. And at some point, you know, you're... And we figure about six to one, a business cannot make a profit at an EROI less than six to one. That's a whole other discussion. Just look at the Canadian tar sand, you know. When the price of oil was around $30, $40 per barrel, they say we, we break even at $25 per barrel. Yeah, and and right. now they're saying we break even at $90 per barrel. Yeah. You know? And that is what yes, so Charles is talking about, energy return on energy investment. Next question. Thomas Lohamal. Um, you have, uh, and I have said that we are uh, running out of cheap oil, and which there's no, no question about that. But uh, I have not heard uh, one mention of carbon dioxide in, in the atmosphere. You are presently very rapidly approaching 400 ppm. Uh, we, we have very sound <coughs> lines of reason telling us that we should uh, go back if possible, to 350 ppm. Mm -hmm. That means we have already em emitted too much fossil uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, you, well, uh, uh, again, uh, the fact that uh, we don't see a growth in the economy with the system we have now without increasing use of energy, and I showed the energy available is fossil fuel. What will help us is the fact that we are reaching a peak in the oil production and it's going to die, go down. We will reach a peak in the natural gas production and it will go down. We will reach a peak in the coal production and it will go down. The fact is that if you look into the scenarios that IPCC is presenting when it comes to the emission of carbon dioxide in the future, those scenarios can in principle not happen. Well, but I think you, you already indicated by your question or through your question that already now we have reasons to be concerned. Yes. So I don't think there is any, any uh, tension Fair here. I mean, we, we, the things we have to do in response to what you have explained are more or less the same things we have to do yes. to respond to climate change and climate security. Yeah. yeah, and I think when we talk about economy and what we really need for survival, it's much easier to accept it. So if it had been energy we had been discussed from the very beginning and not climate change, this had been on a completely different level today. I spent the middle third of my professional life working on CO2, and then I started working on this stuff following in part shell, and I thought this was, uh, if not more important, I, I don't know, if not more important, less understood. 
And uh, so I wasn't invited, and nor you, to come here and talk about uh, climate change. I think we all understand that because it's well understood. It's in the newspapers all the time. Is this stuff in the newspapers? No. No. The denial of it is yes. in the newspapers. Ah, yes. <laughs> Okay, my name is Therese Udenfeldt, I'm a journalist, and I, am, I don't know if you reached the point of explaining the EROI of shale gas and oil, but um, I, I, I just guess it's bad. This is my guess. And then my question is, consequently, how come the price on gas is so low? Gas or gasoline? Uh, uh, shale gas. Uh, well, I'm, we're not talking about gas. I could. Yeah, uh, but she oil, was, okay, I'll talk about... She was mentioning... Uh, shale oil? Shale gas. Shale, I mean, the gas. why is the gas price in U.S. so low? You know? Oh. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it's not just the shell gas, it's the whole gas yes. price. Okay, so One thing you have to understand in the U.S., speaking for the U.S., is that we, we've got all this unconventional gas, and it's a lot. And there's a lot of wells. They're drilling, you know, thousands and thousands of wells. And you drill it, the gas is a little bit different from the oil because you, you can get a profit somewhere. Um, and, and so uh, they overdrilled. And all the gas companies are not making money on this. So Chesapeake, which was the biggest one, sold out. And it, 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 it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, just like Eagle Ford, uh, one of my friends told me, is a Ponzi scheme. But let me do the EROI. We don't know yet. Um, there's yeah. no... You we don't it. get any money to do these things. We just do it on the weekend. But, but, but you, have, you have it on the, the, uh, the uh, Canadian tar sand. You have the, uh, the numbers. Yeah, four to one on tar sands. And on. Uh, I have a graduate student, Egan Wagoner, um, who's supported by a few wealthy people. And he, he has calculated the first EROI from oil from Bakken. And in those sweet spots, it's about 12 to one. And we're not... Sure, yet. We are discussing and doing sensitivity now, but 12 to 1. But when you go out of those sweet spots, it's going to drop off a lot. And I don't know yet what it's going to be. My guess is it will drop off to less than what you can make yeah. a profit uh, on. I, it's uh, a guess. I was last week in a conference in London when uh, these things were discussed very much for Europe. And the final uh, word from the expert was that it's too expensive in Europe. We will never ever see shell gas coming out from the ground. We will never ever see shell oil coming out from the ground in Europe because there is no economy on top. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, last question. Well, we have been, uh, my name is Kai Embren from Respect. Uh, we have been looking at Canada and US, but we have a, an area pretty nearby us. What is your perspective when you look at the Arctic uh, uh, area and uh, <laughs> Yeah. What, what is it advice to the Swedish government to act in the, as a president of the Arctic Council? Well, the uh, uh, United States Geological Survey has made a very detailed analysis of the, say, the sediments that is available down there. And they made some estimation about how much it might be possible to find there. It's published in Nature. And if you look at the different regions, it's very few regions that you really have big enough possibilities to find big oil fields, because you must find fields of the same as Prudhoe Bay in Canada if you go outside there, because it's so ex damned expensive to do the production, you know. Take Russia, for instance. They have already found uh, a giant natural gas field up there, you know, Stockman, but they have decided, no, we will not develop it any longer. It's too expensive for the price. So, uh, so, 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 I mean... The, the, no, the, my the, guess the, is the EROI is probably, I, let's guess, six to one. And, you, and regardless of the price, you can't make a profit on six to one EROI. The companies can't, at least if Kerry King and I are right, yeah. I think we are. The, the, the only spot they, they are kind of sure that they can find something that will be economically feasible is outside Alaska. And some of the companies are allowed to drill there, but they don't do it because they're not sure that will make and money. They, made, they did a very expensive project uh, 15 years, 20 years ago called the Mukluk Field, and that was going to be the next big prudo, and it was a dry hole, but it, it was enormously expensive. I mean, you, you, you should know that drilling one of these exploration wells uh, out there in North East is $300 million, you know. If they find something in North, I mean, it's... $300 million. A typical oil well is $1 million, $2 million. Uh, uh, so, the, uh, so the advice to the Swedish government as chair of the Arctic Council? No, you, Charles. Oh. You can be more free than he can. Yes. 
um, give some money to Shell's group and his graduate students and put them on the project. You, you can't tell what these things are without doing your homework yeah. and, and having discussion and argument about them. Because, you know, we try to give you the best information we have, but as I said, we could be wrong. Um, but, you, but we don't have an infrastructure. I was with his graduate students yesterday, and I have uh, about uh, 10 graduate students who are working on this stuff. It's very expensive uh, and much cheaper in, in where we are in the U.S. than in, in where you are. But we don't get any money to do this. We, we, get, uh, we, we do it kind of sneakily. Um, yeah. uh, I get lots of money to do other stuff, you know, that's not useful but, but, at all. But, but again, I mean, it's a... Invest, I mean, it's, uh, invest in the, the students. Yeah, the, invest in the students. Invest in the graduate students. Invest in the programs. Get, stop giving money to departments of economics. And, and, and uh, I, I like to end with to say that I'm very proud that Uppsala University now has decided to upgrade what I started in yes. the basement of the department. And it will now be a, a full professor share, so share professorship with all the things coming together with that. Your program and my program are pretty close to the only graduate training programs in the world that teach people how to do these analyses. There should be a hundred of them. Well, both of you, thank you very much for um, a most interesting... Thank you.